So today, tomorrow, we will um, So today, tomorrow, we will cover this topic that is again, that is a, it's not again, that is a, let's say, theoretical topic um, before moving to the prototypes and to other more practical things, because we need to understand uh, some theories, some principle, and in a sense, some guidelines that can guide the design of the first prototype and then of all the application. So some, in a way, common sense, uh, general rules that we can think of and apply. And these rules are, are on three different levels. One is the theory level, that is the way, as you can imagine, the more general one, and then principle that's a little bit more concrete, and then guidelines that are extremely concrete. But before that, even if you are not a lot, or, or thanks to the fact that you are not lead a, a lot, let's do this. So, what is this? It's a rating, yes. About what? About what is written? Shopping experience, right? So you shop for something and this pop up on a website and it asks you how likely are you recommend us on a scale to zero to 10. So positives and negatives. Hmm? And it is a positive or a negative? Well, there are 10 shapes, right? One for each score. But they wanted to associate um, uh, let's say an emoji, an expression to each, um, to each score where zero is extremely unlikely and 10 is extremely likely. So sort of a scale, a Likert scale we, we discussed. Uh, we discussed. And, and sorry, this is, um, the, there is one big negative thing here. Um, and that should be, if you think about the interviews and how you created the question, that should be uh, sort of, uh, an indication of which, which, what is the problem here. Well, the colors meaning too many colors or how they use the color? So you, you mean there are colors here in the zero to 10, especially because we don't care about the color of the title, right? In your, in your statement. And these colors are put in a way that you are uh, suggested to vote for which one? Nine and 10. Well, this is a different, right, this is a different level of, of reasoning. Do we need 10, 0, 10, or we just 0, 5, or 1, 5? But the point is exactly, so this is the negative things, right? Uh, well, it's the color, uh, but it's not only the color, it's also, clearly it's the color, but also the expression, right? So, what is, even without the color, Imagine that this is black and white. Which are the fa the faces that you would like to be selected? Again, nine and ten. So yes. So how do we classify this question? This is like 
imagine a question in an interview. Would you classify this question as okay, as, as uh, with some assumption, as leading, as, as what? As leading. This is a leading, well, question because it's trying to force the person to say that with colors and expression, the 9 and 10 are actually the answers, the only positive answers, while actually 6 is still positive between 0 and 10, right? It's not that, that bad, 6. Also, 7 is not that bad. And also, 8 is very, very good between 0 and 10. Not even between 1 and 10, between 0 and 10. So on 11 points, uh, the only, let's say, things that are conveyed as positive are the last two. But actually, again, six, seven, eight are very positive as an answer. So getting an eight out of, out of 11 is still a very, very, very positive answer. So it's not maybe extremely likely, but sort of extremely likely. But here, the, the creator of these are forcing, in a way, are suggesting the only positive answer are nine and 10. And so they want like only the best answer ever. So this is the, the problem, the main problem of this. And then yes, we can discuss colors, we can discuss if it should be maybe one five, it's enough, or one ten instead of zero ten. But that's a scale. Uh, but the main, the main problem is that this is leading. Basically they're saying zero to, to six is bad. That is really, no, not really. Uh, seven, eight is mm, not so good. And the only extremely positive are 9 and 10, with the same expression for both. Mm? So there is no, uh, so here there is very, very unlike face, and here is slightly unlike, and here is medium, and there is a slightly like, slightly smiling face. It's, we pass through neutral to very, very smiley. Um, and so again, this is the, the problem here. And, and I put it here in this moment because we just concluded the interviews. So also recognize these and avoid these in uh, the ratings that you may or may not have in any future application you will uh, create. So some positive things about this, for instance, at least one. It's simple. It's easy to understand if you don't really, let's say, don't really know the numbers, you want to read the numbers, there are also the faces and the color, so it conveys the information in three different ways. Numbers, text, colors, and expression. So multiple ways to convey the same information. Then, in this leading way, but still multiple ways to, con to convey the information. Good. And this is more on the shame thing, clearly, because of this leading part. Okay, so back to what we are going to speak today and tomorrow. Uh, we can imagine, and this is taken from, from a book actually, that to build a successful user interface, a successful interactive system, we need uh, four pillars. And we already have covered one of them up to now, right? The first one, the need finding phase. It's a ethnographic observation, but observation is, is a method of need finding and user interface requirements, eliciting needs to have some task to do, to have some way to synthesize and analyze the needs. So this is one pillar that we covered already. We will cover another pillar that is about prototypes. Not a lot about algorithm, but mostly about prototypes. That is one way clearly to build successful user interface. Uh, and then there is another pillar here that is about evaluation that we will cover in the future. Uh, but today we are mostly interested in this second pillar that is about theories and model and specifically uh, guidelines and principles. Uh, guidelines and principle and theories that are also linked to this fourth pillar because they are the foundation 
the elements that then we can use for instance in the expert review and partially in the usability testing we can use them directly uh, in the expert review we will see that the expert review that is what we have called the heuristic evaluation is actually applying some heuristics some guidelines to evaluate something so some guidelines will help us to evaluate directly because they will be the object we will use during the evaluation but also if we imagine just the usability of an application the evaluation of usability of an application or system in general these guidelines this theory this principle can help us design something that will have less issues in the evaluating phase less problems in a sense so these two parts are linked and they are linked in this way we will use you will use principle guidelines and theories to generate solution solution meaning user interface and we will also see in the future not far away from today how we can use those things either directly or as a base to evaluate the generated design and especially again with the expert review or heuristic evaluation that is one kind of expert review so this is the goal we want to go through this quite theoretical um, approach to understand the the fundamental and then to be able to apply to keep in mind some of these fundamental when designing and evaluating solutions user interfaces and interactive systems so and we are going to speak about these three things today and tomorrow the theories the principle and the guidelines so before i change the slide any idea of which are the differences between theories and principle and guidelines What's a theory? Maybe a theory is proven, while a guideline is just... A theory can be proved, a guideline is just, <laughs> just a guideline. But this is what we can do with a theory. doesn't define what a theory is. So do you think we have seen some theories already in this course? Or not? Think about the first lecture or the second one the second one when we spoke about what is human computer interaction we have spoken about what about what who knows it was just one hour and a half of me speaking for no reason right There was some graphs, we, we spend a little bit of time on, this, on these images and we also think made the example with the door and the, the, the affordances or it was another time but doesn't matter more or less and we talk about execution, we talk about evaluation in this graph, what was this thing? No. We talk about the gulf of evaluation, the gulf of execution. What was this? If you don't remember, I need to explain it again. So now, so. Hmm? Yeah, that was about task. It was before tasks. It was actually the second lecture of the course, where this room was more filled than today.
Okay, what is a, a mental model? Okay, let's go, go back to this. So theories are things like the one that we don't remember now. Um, so more theoretical, more explanation of how the, the words uh, work, right? High level, widely applicable frameworks to draw on during design, during evaluation, during creation, mm, and also to support communication in a sense. Mm. So theories are abstract, our theories are theoretical, mm. and they are general, they are widely applicable. If you are speaking about a door, if you're speaking about a user interface, a graphical user interface, if you're speaking about an airplane and the cockpit, are widely applicable, our general concept. On the other side, we have guidelines. Guidelines are extremely practical, extremely operational. And we have a guideline for each, let's say, specific case that we can think of. So while theories are high level, widely applicable frameworks, guidelines are low level advice about good practices and caution against dangers. So specific things that you can look at and say, okay, this is actually something I can apply in this way to do things correctly. Hmm? Uh, so for instance, there are accessibility guidelines for the web. And those accessibility guidelines for the web, what will be about? In your opinion, if you, even if you don't know. According to the name, what is an accessibility guideline for the web? So which is the context? Does it apply to mobile application? Yes or no? Browsers. Yes, browser. So does it apply to mobile application? No, because it's for the web. Okay, good. Accessibility guideline is about some specific things of operating system? No. What is it about? Interfaces. Yeah, it's in the name. So there are accessibility guidelines. So it's about accessibility. accessibility. So it's a specific case. And what could be this accessibility guideline? Can you imagine some, something or some consequences of this accessibility guideline? What you should have in a web application to be accessible? For instance, to a blind person. Audio description. Audio description if you have images or videos, subtitles, uh, alternative text for images, specific concrete advice for a very specific domain in a specific context. And how do you have alternative description in HTML for images? An attribute that is called no <laughs> it's alternative text so how will the attribute called will be called is called alt like alternative a l t just like in the name okay and these are guidelines right this is an example of a guideline so if you put an image you should have alternative text associated to the image so that if a person cannot see the image there will be some tools that will be able to read the, the description the textual description or if the image does not load in the page you can still read the description of the image. So you have still the content with it. Hmm? And this is a guideline, very, very specific. Principles, so specific case operational. For the web, how do you get the alt attribute? Very, very specific and operational. And in the middle, there are principles that are strategies or rules to analyze and compare design alternatives. So something more, less general than a theory of how things work, but a little bit less, more general than 
for adding the alternative text in a web page you have to use alt attribute and this is the good way to do if you want to fulfill the guidelines for accessibility mm? so something in the middle mm? in, in a way is similar as the level of abstraction so theories are more our well no uh, so principles are a middle ground right between the guidelines and the theory and can be a little bit more general or more towards specific case and could be a little bit more abstract or a little bit more practical it depends on the specific principles and we're going to see eight of them that are called the golden rules the eight golden rules and these are rules but in the form of principle not such specific uh, guidelines but not even generic as the theory but before going to the principle that are in a way the right level of uh, operational to understand it able to apply we need to speak about theories that are the why we are doing these, which are the theoretical framework that enable the principle and the guidelines. So like the fundamentals. So we have, so in general, there are four types of theories. And then these theories may or may not map on some human abilities. And human abilities can be also modeled in some way so the type of theories could be uh, descriptive explanatory prescriptive or predictive according to the type so a descriptive theory it's one that gives you terminology it's one that gives you the semantic about things so it's describing how a certain thing should work or should be the explanatory is a sequence of events with some casual relationships so it explain why things work in a, in a certain way hmm? prescriptives are indication for make decision hmm? so it's written guidelines but still at the level of theory so more generic more abstract and the predictive instead is about more comparison of alternatives based on some performances on some criteria that we can include them. This makes the pair with human capacity that are typically split in these three big areas that are motorial task, motorial action, motorial um, capability, perceptual and cognitive capabilities. So we had already the discussion, but since you don't remember the, the goal for execution, etc., maybe you don't remember that. So just uh, let's revise it briefly. Which are the motor capability of a person? Click. Yeah, click is not really a mode. It's a more yeah, the task is clicking. So it's moving, arm, hands, what else? Even in general moving hands and and head good then which are the motor capabilities that we have the typically developed motor capability walking. walking sit down so the motor capability then in this context are mostly about clicking pointing moving object moving the mouse it's still a motor capability right moving the head to observe things on the screen etc perceptual which are the sensory input sight smell taste well these are the senses right they are smell and touch here have done right and which one are we currently using with a computer system? Not all of them, right? We don't taste, not yet, computer system, right? Sight, so we see things, so vision, touch, touch not really. Yeah, we, we perform the action of tapping or clicking, but we don't, uh, so the sense is more optics or not the sensation if you move 
your finger on a surface, you feel something according to how the surface is, and it's not something we, we do, right, with a computer currently. Hearing, yes, because sounds, because uh, so when you empty the trash on a computer system, there is a sound if you uh, click the, turn on the audio, right? Okay, cognitive. What is cognitive processes, cognitive abilities? Yeah, processing information, understanding the situation and reacting to, to that, but also something else. Memory, yes, memorizing things, short and long term. Hmm? Like we, we all experience now that the normal model that we, we have seen a different version of this, but this you didn't memorize long term this, right? Um, but before going there here. So, okay, these are the things, and so theories are also matches or can have also theory about human abilities. So here there is an example of a theory that is descriptive, the Foley and Van Damme four level approach. Let's say in general, there are four levels of which uh, an interactive system can be described because it is descriptive. And these four levels are the conceptual level, the semantic level, the syntactic level, and the lexical level. And each of them is more precise than the other one. So the conceptual level is the generic user mental model of the system. And we said that the mental model of a system is definition or example. Okay. Mental models is actually pro probably one of the most fundamental things to, to know and remember because it will actually avoid problems after the need finding phase in your prototype. So what is a mental model of a person, of an hypothetical user of your application? Yeah, that's an example of a possible mental model. That's more, more in general. It's biases. it's biases. Yes, not only. That's one bomb part, like more one, one negative if one part of the, of the mental model. It's how a person, whoever it is, conceptualize how to use something, how to approach with something, how to understand something. It's the idea that if I do this, then something would happen. And this will bring the assumption, the biases that the person has, clearly, but it also brings the information that other similar systems have given. So again, in the case of the door, why we know that to open that door, we need to push it? Because there is an angle that give us affordances that ask us to push the handle and not to turn up or down. And we approach this with our model of how a door and an handle works. And this is the mental model that we have. When you log in on the Polytechnic website, you have your own mental model or what are the things that you are seeing and what you expect when you click on something. And if this is not happening, then there is a problem, there is a, one of the gulf of execution or evaluation that we, uh, we, sh we mention and we are going to re-mention in a while. And this is the conceptual level. And then there is the semantic, so it's more abstract, right? And then there is the semantic level that describes the specific meaning conveyed by each inputs and the output. So it's more precise. I see something, there is a description, there is an output, what happens, what is the meaning of that specific action? And it's the semantic level, like the semantic of the operation that we are going to do. Then there is the syntactic level that defines how the word are assembled, how the information, the pictures, the buttons, the colors are assembled to instruct 
the computer to perform a certain task that we expect according to the semantic and according to our mental model of the system. And then there is the lexical level that is the, in the device dependencies and the mechanism that are helpful to define the syntax, the semantic and the conceptual. And it's just a descriptive, it's not saying how to do that, it's saying these are the full level that exist for every interactive system. And then instead we have the model like this one, that was just the spread out model that we have seen in the second lecture, that is explanatory, right? It explains why things work or not work, it does not describe how a user interface is, it does not describe what is a syntactic level or semantic level. So now that you see the picture, do you remember sort of and, and can read the slide? So do you remember the steps, the seven steps that are here and where they happen? So there is the person and what is this task language? It's how the person express what he wants to do or she wants to do, right? Is, I want to enroll to an exam. I want to do some exercises in some field. It's my wording of the activity, the task I'm going to do. Hmm? So it's similar to the task we, are, we ask you to create for the prototype. It's a user perspective of the task. It's not the system perspective of the activities. How high would do things? And then there is the thinking, that is the articulation, hmm? in which the person does what? It's written. You just need to put the numbers close to the right arrows. One and? One and two, right? Well, Maybe mm -hmm. so there is forming the goal, so the task I want to do, forming out the plan, the action, what I should do to fulfill my goal, to realize this task, and then there is some input mm, in a computer that allow me to perform this and this will lead to some performance on the system. And which are these other two languages? So this is a task language, right? We said that the user has its own way to represent what you want to do, and we call it task language that is closer to the task we are going to ask you to do. What is the UI language? The way the interface, uh, describes, the way the interface describes what it's, it's needed to fulfill the task. And what are the core language on the system instead? The more technical aspects like? It's about the more technical aspects, not only technical like computer technical, but also a detail. Maybe it's about law, it's about regulation. So it's about specific terminology that the system should use to interact with a database, another user, other kind of activities, etc. And in many cases, the core language and the user interface language can be the same. And ideally, the task language, the UI language, and the core language should be as much as similar as possible, especially the UI language. And then we have the, the opposite. Uh, after the system, after you do an input, the system, what does the system here? Presentation. What's the presentation that the system can provide? The feedback about the action presents some results as an output. And then the observation. 
how the user, user observe this, understand and how the user interpret, perceive. So I wanted to enroll to an exam. Is this went well or not? And so I perceive the state, the results visually, let's say, or vocally. I can see and understand interpreter that yes, this is going well or not. And then I can say, okay, I did fulfill my goal. I completed my task or not. So if, for instance, it didn't go well, I need to do something else, right? To, to or redo the task or change some strategies. Hmm? Okay, and we said that this goal of execution and goal of evaluation are the distance between the user in a way and the system, and they should be A, larger as possible, or B, smaller as possible smaller as possible that was easy so let's make an example of the gulf execution so when also in the physical world uh, we can have a gulf of execution and you can use the, the example of the door if you want so the gulf of execution is when the task language and so the articulation, the poor performance. So I want to do something. I have uh, an idea how to do that, and I'm going to do that. But then, it is not possible to do that, right? I'm I'm using the wrong option, in a sense. And so there is a gulf of execution because I cannot really execute the things I want. So think at the door. The door is a good example for the gulf of execution. Yes, yeah, so when you are in front of the door and instead of pulling, you're pushing or vice versa. That is a gulf execution in practice, a big gulf execution, because I have an intention, I want to open the door, I, want to, and I need to pull it because everything in the door in the end is telling me, according to my mental model, that I need to push, but this is not opening, and then I discover that I need to pull, to pull instead. Okay, the gulf of evaluation instead in this sense, in that case of the door, is small or big? I go there, I pull the, por the door, the end all, instead of pushing. There's a huge gulf of execution, but gulf evaluation is big or not in that case? It's very small, because I immediately understand that something is not, is not working, so that I can go back here and articulate and change approach. An example where the gulf of, execution of evaluation is large. or can be large. So there is a fan. I turn on the fan, switching something on a wall, and the fan is not starting or stopping or I am on a website, I click on a link, and nothing happens. This is, these are big, big gulf of evaluation, because I cannot evaluate what's going on. I did the right action, I click on a link, but nothing's happening. So I don't know if I, is the action correct, if it's the system that is broken, or I just need to wait. So this is a big, goal of execution, even the evaluation, even the execution is small, right? Because I, I have an end goal, I have to click on a link, it is not, not a, a match of things. So there is no problem on the bottom part of this, but there is problem on the upper part of this. And I can totally understand why this is, sounds so theoretical and high level, but um, I also know that if you don't take these things in mind, you will discover it in the evaluation, when you're going to do evaluation, and that will penalize in a way, will ask you to do many, many modifications 
to your prototypes just because you didn't think about these more abstract things. And it's something you have to think about. I'm just introducing doubts. I'm just having people thinking what to do. I'm just using not the people language in the user interface, but some strange language that I only know or not. So I'm trying to increase the goal of execution and evaluation or I'm providing a smooth system. So no specific guidelines, no specific principle. Principle help and guidance helps in concretizing this, but this is also something that you should be able to think uh, on your own. Um, you made an example of not getting response from our website as the, for the goal yeah. of And the, uh, how, can, uh, how can we evaluate all of uh, uh, large, uh, is, the, um, is the goal of evaluation in this case, if we never get a reference? Is it about time or is it about... Uh, well, in that case, again, it's not so it's actually a good question, so how can we evaluate how big is the goal of evaluation? So it's not about evaluating how big it is, and it's not even about understanding if it's about time, or it's, it's about recognizing that there, there is a problem. And the system, so maybe it's the system to reply to that click on the link needs five minutes. Let's say five minutes, it's an enormous time for a web application, right? But let's say that it's five minutes. Then why we don't communicate? That's the action. That is the concrete thing to do. Why don't we communicate, present to the output that the operation is successful, but you just need to wait five minutes to get the answer. It's setting the expectation of the person so that the person knows that it's able to evaluate its own action. The click went well or not, or need to click again. And maybe it's just waiting, or maybe it's just is broken, so I, whatever I click is not happening anything. So providing the right level of information, in that case, help to minimize the goal for uh, evaluation. So the problem can be either in the presentation phase or in the Mm -hmm. But uh, in, the, in the observation phase, maybe it's the user that doesn't understand the, the UI. Well, yes and no. Because uh, let's use this that is pretty extremism as an approach, but it helps. Uh, there is no the user does not understand the UI. Is there is the UI is terrible and needs to be changed or the user needs more training, but still, mm, so the problem is in the presentation. Then the person can have, you know, maybe the, the presentation is just visual and the person cannot see. Mm? So there could be a problem in the observation, but then the solution is not making the person see, the solution is providing an alternative way to represent the trouble. So presentation again. So the fix of the things, let's assume this is not always true, but let's assume this like in a very, very hard way. Problems are never people, it's technology. So if the, present, if the person does not understand, it is the user interface or the system that needs to be updated. It's not person, right? Every time you get frustrated with some um, a polytechnical system, would you like if I say you, but no, the system is perfect, it's you that are wrong. No. It's the system that needs to be updated to fulfill the need of the person that needs to use it and the task according to their own languages. That is here, right? And then I can articulate the wrong uh, input because of my history, because of my assumption, because of my bias. So that could be also something wrong but the user interface should make clear which are the options that I have so that minimize any mistakes I can make according to my bias, etc. So the changes, and that's why we're doing this course actually, is all about not saying, oh, but people are stupid. No, it's the system that needs to be uh, made up to excellent standards to communicate and present information the best way as possible when needed, okay? But, was a good question, actually. Um, 
Okay, and then there are other theories like the prescriptive. This is a consistency theory. We will find the consistency a lot of time because it's also a principle to be consistent. And so this is a theory that say that the consistency of noun and verbs reduce learning time and errors. So clearly if you see something like this in a user interface, that is what all these options do? What's the first option do? Hello? What's the first option do? Think it's a button. Let's say delete charter. What is doing this button? It's not a tricky question. It's actually what is doing the button. It's like text comprehension. It will delete a single character, right? And if you see the other one, delete word, will delete a word or select the word, etc. And here the consistency is helping because if instead you're saying delete instant charter and then in the next button you say remove add word and then other synonyms, find multiple synonyms, one person can ask, oh, wait, but there is difference between insert and that? or not. And so it's putting more time on the articulation, extending the growth of execution. So consistency on the same set of things help reduce time and errors. Because once I learned that delete charter means one thing, when I found the same word with word or line or paragraph, I know what's the output and that's what is the result. I have my expectation met. And consistency is not about words only, but also about colors, layout, fonts, buttons, etc. So for instance, would it be better to have an application with one page, one screen, with a specific layout, and the same application with another screen with a totally different layout, or not? Would it be better have the same layout across the entire application or every page change layout randomly? The same layout. Why? Because the user became familiar with the layout, so it's easier to find information, to find the options. So if the logout is on the up right corner, it will always be there. And indeed, how many applications change? or web application, or mobile application, or desktop application, change the layout randomly. I would say, I would like to say none of them, uh, but we see that some do, but in error. But, but still, hmm, they shouldn't, because consistency help familiarizing, help reducing error, help reducing frustration, help Aband avoiding ab abandoning the app or complaints or opening tickets or call to the support system if there is one. Mm -hmm. And so we, have, we will talk a, lo a lot about consistency and also inconsistency may be used in some cases for drawing attention and we will see an example later on. So consistency is good but in some cases we want to introduce some inconsistency in it to uh, break the usual things and get the attention on something that in that case is important and is different. And this is about theory and types of theories. Uh, the, the first slide had another column that was about human capability. So quite quickly, uh, there are also models that describe or try to describe how people work, in a sense. And this is one of the probably older and models, and it's called the human processor model. That is a cognitive modeling method that is used to calculate, to compute, how long it takes for a person to perform a given task. Hmm? To compute mathematically, to compute with numbers. Hmm? And this can be helpful to predict the system performance, uh, even before doing an actual test of performance. 
So just we know the numbers, so we know that this will take three seconds, and so we can say, okay, three seconds is too much or not to this. Hmm? And, and this model is, is simple, it's a simplification, especially about the cognitive part, and it tries to make an analogy between the storage and the processing area of a computer with the equivalent of a person, so the motor, cognitive, and memory areas of a person. And it underlines other usability techniques, and other models like GOMS that is actually a model and KLM that is a model to predict how fast people will write on a keyboard, changing the layout of the keyboard, changing the, the kind of elements in the keyboard, in, just in case you want to create a new keyboard or you need a keyboard on screen. And without going too much into detail, but what this, this model say, say that, okay, you will have some visual input and we have a perceptual processor, hmm, analogy with the computer system, let's say that a person typically need 100 milliseconds to process uh, an information that is perceived, and then there is a range between 80 and, and 50 and 200, but on average is 100. And then after perceiving that, we go in the working memory, that is a short-term memory, they could be visual or auditory, and according to if it's a visual component or it's um, auditory components, then there are different timing to be considered. Uh, there is also the long-term memory that you see there is no arrow linking the working memory and the long-term memory. That is where the information eventually go when they are deemed important or they happen frequently, etc. And then there is cognitive processes that ask for other time, so on average 70 milliseconds to process a bit of information. Hmm? So 100 to get information from the visual channel, and then let's say uh, 200 uh, for getting an image, and then another 70 for processing that image. Hmm? So we have seen an image, and this is what happens, right? And then Let's say there's just one cycle here, uh, and then there is the, the motor processor, the one that allows us to react to the information we just get. And this also has some other time. So if we have a task, and we have a system, and we want to know if this task is demanding, is long, um, or if the person will remember an item that's seen on a screen during a task after five minutes, or after a multi-step, uh, form feeling, then this could be a, a good way to predict hmm, if this will take too much and how probable it is that the person will forget that bit of information. Hmm. And there are two things missing here, at least. One, I told you, this is a model, it's not a complete model, it's a simplistic model. So which are the two things to you that is missing here? One we mentioned before when we spoke about senses and the other one is actually something I, I just said 30 seconds ago. So speaking about working memory in both sense. I was speaking about working memory and it's also about your working memory to remember what I said 30 seconds ago. Which are the two things that here are missing to you? The two pieces of elements or the two arrows that are missing. How do we bring information from the working memory to the long memory? Do you see anything? No. Because this model does not represent how we move information from the long term, the short memory to the long term memory. So that is one thing that is missing. And the other one that is missing, we mentioned before, she mentioned before when we were speaking about senses. Now sight is here, it's the visual part. Here there is the visual and the auditory part for the uh, working memory. But we said that we can also have... A auditory is hearing, right? So the main two are represented. 
haptic. We said this, we don't interact a lot with computer in haptics, but this is more general. It's not just about computer as a model. And so haptics, if you know that something is burned or extremely hot, or extremely cold, you will not go there and touch it again, hopefully. So this is something that we have in our long-term memory or short-term memory, it depends. And this give us processing cognition and this also give us motor not to do something or to do it again. So this is a model, it's like a theory of how a person work. And this will be uh, useful also after. Uh, the working memory that is short memory has a small capacity and here there's an error, I will fix it. Um, as a small capacity. So it's able to remember seven plus minus two pieces of information. Uh, and here there are actual examples. If you look at this, and then I cover it, and I will tell you, tell me this for number. This is totally fake, so I don't know if there is someone, uh, I just invented it, but maybe it's true, it's real. If you look at this number, and it told you, tell me the fourth um, number, and I clearly hide that, you probably aren't able to remember because this is a chunk of information that is pretty big. But if I give you this number in this sense, in this way, it's easier for you, it's the same information, the same number, but divided with some spaces, it's easier for you to remember. And same things for these letters. If I gave you F, G, I, double H, J, L, M, Q, and say, okay, now repeat. You will have way more difficulties than saying F, G, I, now remember F, G, I. And H, 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 J, but you probably still remember F, F, G, F, G, I. So this is small capacity, seven plus minus two chunks, so between five and nine chunks of information and it's a, a rapid access uh, but it's decay so after a while that we don't use the information we lose it it's the short-term memory and after a few seconds of continued use we pass this information to the long-term memory and then it can be forgotten or not but it's still in the long-term memory after a while and the long-term memory according to the model is instead huge it's almost unlimited, the things we can remember in long-term memory. Then we selectively choose not to remember them, but it's more a biological process, but as a slower access time. So access is something that we just read, is quicker than remembering something that we have learned five years ago, or a few classes ago. And then there is another model that is actually widely used and if you want to play, this is an interactive sort of game, and that link, we are not going to, to do it now. Um, that's called the Fitz Law, and notice the double S here, because it's the name of the person that was called Fitz, Paul Fitz, that was a psychologist and was examining the human motor system in 1954, so not applicable to human computer interaction. But he discovered basically what's written there, and the short version is um, that if you have two targets and the longer the distance are between them and the smaller they are, the longer it takes to the person to reach the target, from one, to move from one target to the other. And think about it, if you have the mouse pointer, and this applies only to non-continuous things. Drawing is a continuous operation, so it does not apply. But clicking, touching, selecting, these are things that apply. So basically, we would say that if you have a big button, big button closer one each other, they are easier and quicker to select, to operate, than with less error than two small buttons very, very far one from, from another, and from you, where you are with the pointer, with the toucher. So this is 1954, it was used in 1980-something in uh, HCI for the first time, and for instance, influenced the convention of making 
interactive button large, especially on smartphone and similar? Why the button on smartphone are bigger than the one on computers? Be because of this, clearly because the finger is bigger than mouse pointer, but how big should be? This law is a mathematical law. It's give you a number how, how big should be in the end. Hmm? It computes the difficulty, the, the, the distance, and you can optimize that. And also the distance between a user task or attention area, so where I'm looking for, what I'm focusing on, on an application, and the button related to the task should be as short as possible. If I have an operation and then the button is totally on the other side uh, of the page, I need to scroll left and down to reach it, I will not see it and we need to look for it and this will clearly uh, use a lot of time. So why is bad? Because we can uh, understand not only from a... Mm, perspective that is well it's hidden etc but also we can compute that this is actually worse than a button in a different position mm? and without going to the extreme in this way also buttons closer uh, we can understand if it's one is closer to the other and to the attention point we are we have mm? so this is a law that we we didn't go we don't go in, into details there is also formulation a mathematical formulation but we are not extremely interested in it but we're interested in remember that there are these laws, there are these mental models that tell you how things work. And so if you present multiple, for instance, information in a form, and you ask on page one to remember the information that then is needed on page seven, then don't be surprised that people cannot remember it because working memory. So don't put them there. And again, if you want, there is this demonstration. This is a sort of small game that proves these things and give you numbers on clicking on elements on screen. Okay, and this closed the theory. So theory, generic, abstract, you can use it. So Fitz was, was born for human model system, nothing related to pointer, mouses, and touch screens, but still applied. And also the, the, the human process model, the same, right? It's just a model simplified, not correct, not complete, how our people work, but gives some interesting hints on timing, on uh, mental mode, on memories, especially memories, and what we can consider. Mm? So uh, visual input and as auditory inputs are actually perceived different and with different timing in a, in a, in a, in a person. Mm? So we have different reaction. Design principle are, if theories are the why, Design principle are the what. So they are more practical, the theory, the theory. They are still widely applicable, more than guidelines. And they are fundamental principle. They are fundamental principle that help us to determine, some, to consider some skill levels of the person and react accordingly, and also help us identify the task. And design principle, if applied well, will help us to prevent errors and also to give the right level of control to the person using an interactive system. And we are going to see there are many principles. They are more or less, they overlap in some part. And in some principle, we will find again something that we have seen in theories like consistency, like memory will go back in the principle because principles are more specific than uh, than theories. And we are going to see, as I said, told you before, eight of this principle, one set of principles that are the eight golden rules of interface design. There are many others, but these eight are more than enough for what we, we, want, to, we want to do and want to discuss. And they relate to five primary interaction styles as well, that are the way in which people can interact with a uh, computer system that are these five. Hmm? Each of them has their pros and cons, but so let's try to discuss about them. So what is direct manipulation? Do you use it, direct manipulation, on your computer, or on your smartphone, or your tablet? Yes or no? direct manipulation.
what do you think it is? Yes, in virtual reality you may have, but also I can assure you you have on your computer, on your laptop, on your desktop computer. So real reality. What is direct manipulation? What what the name told you? No, not to customize. Hmm? I haven't heard it, sorry. You are too far away. But if someone have heard, they can repeat, maybe. Clicking. clicking, no, clicking is not direct manipulation. Sort of, almost. It involves the mouse on a computer, direct manipulation. No, touch is like clicking, just on a different surface. Hmm? Drag, and drop. drag and drop. Have you ever dragged something from a folder to another, or from one position to another? That is direct manipulation. You are manipulating directly an element of the user interface. So it's not about personalization, it's about moving things around. Hmm? And these are advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so there are actually quite a lot of advantages. So visually present as concept, imagine to drag and drop things. You clearly have a visual representation and it's easy to learn and easy to retain the, the things that you've learned. You can, once you discover that you can move one thing to another place, you will do it because it's similar to the physical world where you can get one thing and move from one place to another. So it's something that you learn easily because you directly manipulate the, rea the environment. Um, encourage exploration. You don't really, with direct manipulation, have any huge drawbacks. You can do things and it's always, almost always easy to go back. If you drag and drop something from one place to the other, it's easy to go back without any problem hmm? or without any consequences. Uh, there are disadvantages, like maybe art to program. Clearly, implementing drag and drop is more difficult than implementing click mm. or one of the other interaction styles. And clearly requires things you can use for this kind of data manipulation, a mouse, a touch screen, etc. And this is one interaction style, one that's quite used in contemporary system. The other one is menu selection. That should be easier. What is menu selection? Just like the name, so what do you do? It's selecting something from a menu, like the edit menu, the file menu, and many programs, right? And all these interaction styles can, can coexist. You can have direct manipulation and some menus within the environment where you have direct manipulation. And again, also in this case, there are advantages and disadvantages. Um, this is nice. Maze law, you can read it, but maybe not on the screen, but you can read on the slide. One disadvantage of menu selection is maze law down frequent user. What it means? Why menu selection can slow down frequent user? Yes. You if you frequently use that command, you all, all the time have to open that menu and go down to the list and maybe it's in a sub-menu, et cetera. So it's low down. And which are one possible solution to this slowing down? Shortcuts. So when you have to copy and paste something and you're going every time to the menu, edit, or you press Ctrl-C, Ctrl-V, or Command-C, Command-V. Shortcuts. Hmm? Because menu selections slow down for this frequent operation. And there's nothing you, you can do within the menu, if not providing alternatives. Uh, and it also consumes screen space and 
clearly if you just have a pure menu selection application you will have multiple menus with information nested and you need to find information etc another interaction style form filling Yeah, it, it's, it's about forms, like the forms that we have on the web and filling them and then next and then another page and then next, etc. cetera. Um, it's clearly very useful for data entry as we use uh, form and uh, clearly consumes space on screen because forms will have filled with the labels and will have validation and buttons, go back, go next, uh, remember information from one page to another, etc. Common language. It doesn't. What is common language? Maybe if I told you that appeals to power to power user with common prompt. Hmm? So it's the typing. Hmm? It's it's a not, it's, a, it's not a graphical user interface. It's a textual user interface, and it's common language. But it's a user interface. It's an interaction style. You want to use Git and you want to use a graphic user interface, you have to remember all the option or many of the option that the Git um, tool will provide you. Push, pull, commit, commit minus M, minus AM, add, etc., etc. So it's flexible. You cannot put, we have seen the first or in the second actually lecture what this, that user interface, if you remember, that I told you is basically Vuget, uh, but this developer put it as a graphic user interface, putting all the possible options in one screen. And it was a mess as a user interface. Because clearly common language has way more flexibility in the things you can do. But it asks you to remember things, it asks you to handle errors, because you need to remember hmm, to what to do, or look for what to do. Finally, Natural language. What is natural language as an interaction style? Speaking or writing in natural language. So using the, the language that we have. Um, and clearly as when it works as a huge advantage that you don't have to learn in a way the commands where the information are in the in the menu or how to use a mouse because you just need to speak or write in your natural language clearly it has a lot of issues as also today because it doesn't have the context or you don't have the context where the conversation is and you have if you think of Alexa or other things, you have to remember which are the options you can say. You cannot speak and say everything. You have specific command in a way. So things like Alexa, etc., are a mix. is natural language, but is actually command based. You cannot say everything. There is a set of a limited, not infinite set of commands that the virtual system can understand. So you can only speak about the things they understand. Um, and sometimes it could be unpredictable. There are many, many drawbacks. It's clearly intuitive to use because you ideally just speak, but then it's way more complex to make it and make it right. And there is also a lot of memorization. You need to remember what to ask to, if we think about Alexa or Google Assistant or others. But these are the five interaction styles we all experience in um, in interactive system and again they have pros and cons and they can be mixed together as we have seen so tomorrow we will start again from here so these slides was just saying that clearly we can also extract principle from the theory so these are five four principles extracted from the normal model that say that state and action alternative should be visible there should be a good conceptual model that is consistent with what happens 
and it should be a proper user interface language, some things that we can derive from the, from the model is also users should receive continuous feedback because clearly there is this loop that cannot be interrupted in a way. Uh, but we will see all of them and something more in these eight golden rules of interaction interface design uh, tomorrow. So have a good evening and afternoon and see you tomorrow.